Um, we're very happy today to welcome Dr. Nathalia Holt, who's joining us from Boston. Um, she did a PhD with Paula Cannon at USC, uh, looking at uh, zinc, finger, zinc finger nucleases uh, to knock out CCR5. Um, she then went to Boston and worked at the Reagan Institute, which is a um, sort of collaborative institute between MIT, Harvard, and Mass General, um, and worked with Bruce Walker there. And uh, now she's uh, moved more into uh, science writing, and um, specifically uh, HIV and the subject of HIV cure. So I know this is a hot topic. Um, <coughs> to hear about it, want to know what it means. It can be very confusing. I think uh, Nathalia is going to tell us um, about the science, but also about the stories behind the Berlin patients. So um, I think you'll find it very interesting. And so uh, the title of our presentation is Chasing a Cure, the Story of the Berlin Patients. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I did something unusual. I did my PhD here at USC and then did a postdoc and then decided to write a book. And so this book is called Cured and it's about the personal stories of the two Berlin patients and their physicians and how they're influencing research today. And for this audience, I'm not going to go into exactly what's happening with HIV science and HIV medicine today. Instead, I'm going to talk a lot more about the history and the personal stories of the men involved. But the first question is why we can't cure HIV. Um, and the first point here is that the HIV reservoir is simply too big. It's in too many tissues. We don't even know exactly where the virus is hiding we're still grappling with this issue of understanding where HIV is in the body. And secondly, HIV is able to rapidly mutate, so any cure that we develop would then have to be one step ahead of the virus. Another point is that cure strategies are simply too complicated and too expensive. I've heard them called a first world solution to a global problem. And then probably the point that irks me the most is when we hear that people living with HIV don't need and don't want a cure. And so the idea here is that because we have therapies that are able to keep people alive and keep people healthy, we shouldn't be doing HIV cure and eradication research. And I think this really gets back to the stigma associated with HIV, where we would treat it differently than we would, say, other manageable diseases, where we don't question the need for research and we don't question the need to continually try to make people's lives better. So there's all these reasons why we can't possibly cure HIV, um, except for the fact that we can. And so we now know that there are a small group of people that are functionally cured of HIV, and what is surprising is how big an impact their individual stories have had. So I'm going to start today by talking about Dr. Heiko Jensen. And he's a family doctor in, physic, um, in Berlin, and he has a clinic there where he sees mostly young gay men. He sees a lot of acute HIV. And so in 1993, he was traveling with his boyfriend in Washington, D.C. Uh, when his boyfriend started to get sick and had you know, basic flu-like symptoms, and for most physicians, they wouldn't be worried about this. But for Heiko, who saw so many acute HIV patients in his clinic, his mind immediately jumped to HIV. And this was also because a few weeks earlier, Andrew, his boyfriend, had told him he cheated on him. So when they got back to Berlin, Heiko tested his blood, and the test was positive. And they were both devastated because this was 93. The only therapy was AZT, and it simply wasn't able to keep people alive. So Heiko was desperate to find some way to save Andrew. And when he was thinking about this, he was very influenced by Dr. David Ho, who at this time was interested in this hit hard, hit early approach to HIV. So nobody knew when to initiate therapy, of course, in 1993, and we still don't really know today. But Dr. Ho had this idea that if you treat it early, you could get the virus before it established a foothold in the body. Um, and there wasn't any data to support this. It was just an idea that intuitively made sense to Heiko. So he knew he wanted to start therapy soon. And so one of the first calls he made was to Dr. Robert Gallo. And so Heiko had done some training with Gallo after he finished med school. And so he called him just desperate for anything he had. 
And Gallo said, well, I really don't have anything, but why don't you talk to a postdoc in my lab, whose name is Juliana Litowitz, and maybe she can help you. And so Juliana said, well, we really don't have anything, but we have found that this one drug in cell culture seems to be, seems to have some kind of effect. And this drug was hydroxyurea. It was a cancer drug. And the idea was that if given in combination with AZT, it was a way to attack the cell. And so instead of the virus, you're kind of freezing the cell and then allowing AZT to come in and put in its false building blocks in the DNA. But the problem, of course, is that no one had ever taken this drug for HIV. Nobody knew what dose would be appropriate. No one knew if this would be toxic. But Heiko didn't care about any of this. He felt like it was his best bet for saving Andrew. And so he decided to give him this drug. Now, you can imagine that he didn't want to do this in Berlin because it's not exactly ethically a good idea to treat your boyfriend or family member. And so to do this, they went to a small island off the coast of northern Germany. And they stayed there for two months. And every day, Heiko would take the ferry into the hospital, and he would get the drugs, so both hydroxyurea and AZT, and bring them back to Andrew. And after two months, Andrew was just done. He couldn't stay on this island. He couldn't stay secluded anymore. And he just decided, I don't want to be with you. I don't want to take this anymore. And I'm going to go back to the US. Um, and Heiko was, was heartbroken. He still calls Andrew the love of his life. Um, but what he got from this experience was this idea that he wanted to do more for his patients with HIV, and he wanted to be able to pursue this idea of eradicating the virus. And so this experience really stuck with him and would end up changing the way he would treat his patients in his clinic. So now in 1996, Giro Hüter was a medical student in Berlin. He wasn't interested in HIV. He wasn't interested in infectious disease. He wasn't even really that good a student. <laughs> but he, uh, he happened to be sitting in the med school library, and he came across this paper in Nature and was knocked out by it. As soon as he read it, he said, well, HIV is over. We're going to have a cure. We're going to have a vaccine soon. And so this paper looked at the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. And so people that are homozygous for this mutation have resistance to HIV, and it's found in high proportion in European populations. And so Gero was so impressed by this. He could have little idea that in 10 years, he would be going back to this paper when he came across his first HIV patient. Now that same year, 1996, the first Berlin patient came to see Heiko Jensen. So this man, Christian, was a, a patient of Heiko's. And he came to see him a few days after having sex at a party. Um, at the time, you know, it wasn't very common to give PCR tests. But Heiko was still very interested in this idea of treating patients acutely. And he was also interested in adding in hydroxyurea, because he still felt like this was an interesting drug and he wanted to do a small trial of patients that he felt like could be good candidates for this. And so when he saw Christian come into his clinic, he thought, this is a responsible young man, and he'll be able to take what is admittedly a very difficult drug regimen. So he enrolled him in this trial, and he gave him these three drugs, so hydroxyurea, DDI, and indinavir. And the schedule for these drugs was very difficult, because he had to take them around meals. He had to be taking drugs three times a day. And it was not an easy schedule for Christian to follow. But as he took the drugs, he did kind of an odd thing. He thought back to this toilet bowl cleaner commercial that he remembered in the 70s, where a blue pill went into a toilet bowl and magically turned the water clear. And so three times a day as he was taking his drugs, he visualized this and imagined the virus leaving his body. Now, 1996 was just a difficult year for Christian. Shortly after being diagnosed with HIV, he had epididymitis. And because of this, he went to the ER. And the doctors there said, I don't understand why you're on any of these drugs. First of all, you're acutely infected with HIV, so you don't need to be taking anything. And why are you taking this crazy cancer drug? And so they basically just told him, look, you have a terrible family doc, and 
this isn't going to work. Um, so we went off drugs, and there's kind of a small, little, tiny little blip of virus during that time. And then just a few months later, he got hepatitis A, and now he also had to go off therapy. So he had these two treatment interruptions during his approximately six months of therapy. And after he got out of the hospital and he had just felt like his body was you know, riddled with viruses, and he was in his dorm room, and it was a snowy day, and he opened up the windows and took a deep breath of air, and he just, he felt like the virus was gone from his body. And there was no reason why he should think that, but he told Heiko, I'm not taking the drugs anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that I no longer have the virus in me. And so Heiko explained, well, you haven't been on the therapy very long, but he didn't press him into going back on the drugs because he felt like this was an individual decision he had to make, and he knew that he could just continually monitor the virus and Christian, and that if it came back, they could always restart therapy. But what happened is that the virus didn't come back. And here you can see that the virus has, has just remained, and even today, it hasn't come back in Christian. So Heiko told his collaborators, he called Juliana, no one really wanted to believe him. Um, but finally they said, well, we have to figure out what's going on here. And so one of the first people they called was Bob Silicano. And so he had just published this very influential paper showing that even if HIV is indetectable in the blood, you can still find it at these tiny levels in, of resting T cells. So they sent half a liter of Christian's blood to Silicano, and he couldn't find anything. And they knew this didn't make any sense because he'd had, he'd had uh, uh, some viremia and acute infection. There had to be HIV somewhere in him. Um, and Silicano said, well, I'm just going to redesign my assay. And as kind of a compliment to Christian's immune system, he made it five times more sensitive and now, when they sent another half a liter of blood, he was now able to find this sort of less than one replication competent HIV in about 10 million cells. Uh, so the next person they called was Cecil Fox, and he had just published this, this great paper looking at how HIV hides in the lymph nodes. So they did a lymph node biopsy in Christian, sent it to him, and Cecil said, well, I really can only see a trace of HIV. I can't measure it. And so once again, they said, OK, you have to redo this. They did another biopsy. And this time, he was able to detect three HIV RNA positive cells in about 40 million. And so now, at least they knew that there was still some HIV and some replication competent HIV in Christian. But what they didn't understand is why the virus wasn't coming back. And so for that, they made a call to Bruce Walker. And so Bruce Walker had become well known at this point for his work with HIV controllers. And he had developed this beautiful assay where he could look at the HIV specific responses in CD8 T cells. And so they, they got these cells to Bruce and he found that yes indeed, Christian had these HIV specific responses. Um, and at the time, uh, everyone involved was, was, was fairly clear that this, this was probably a case of, of being treated early and of being given this kind of extra eradication drug, some combination of the two. Um, but since then, there have, been, there have been some questions of whether or not Christian may have, may have been an HIV controller. And these are still not completely clear. But what you can imagine is, is that in 1998, this got a lot of attention. So as much attention as the Berlin patients got today, in 1998, this got articles in New York Times and in Newsweek, and people were very excited about this HIV cure case. And so they published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and almost immediately the collaborators kind of split into two camps. Uh, so Bruce Walker and his collaborators were really interested in pursuing early treatment and these treatment interruptions that Christian had gotten. And this was an area that they had already been very interested in, but they simply didn't have any case that could really spur them into going ahead with clinical trials. And Heiko and Juliana and their group were very interested in this idea of hydroxyurea and antiretroviral therapy.
So at first, early therapy and these treatment interruptions seemed promising. It looked good. So you have here individuals that have been treated, acutely treated, have these high HIV-specific T-cell responses that are very similar to that of HIV controllers. And what was even more impressive was that it seemed to correspond exactly to the viral load in these patients. People were very excited about this, uh, but then not so much, because it turns out that almost all of these patients, the virus came back and it simply wasn't a durable way to treat HIV. And similarly for hydroxyurea, there were these two approaches. So there was this family medicine approach, Heiko's approach, where he selected patients that he felt like could responsibly take these drugs, and he only took patients that were acutely infected with HIV. He structured the timing so that it would limit toxicity in these patients. But then when it was time to do a big clinical trial, things had to change. So now they weren't, weren't just looking at acute HIV, they would get patients anytime during infection. They changed the timing to taking these doses just once a day, so that way it would be easier for patients to take. And because this was a Bristol-Myers uh, squib trial, uh, they added this drug Xeret, D4T, to increase profitability. And this is because hydroxyurea isn't a drug that anyone could make any money off of. Um, the patent had long expired. But this Xeret drug was one that, even though it was an older drug, had been newly patented. So it had this ability to, to make some money in a clinical trial. Uh, and when Heiko saw what was happening, he decided that he didn't, he didn't want to participate in this. He felt like, because of these changes, it was simply too dangerous, and it, it would have too much toxicity for the patients involved. Now, looking at kind of the family medicine approach, hydroxyurea, plus these antiretrovirals looked very promising. So when you had these patients who were early in infection and were treated, it, it kind of seemed like it worked. It seemed like you went from these viral loads at entry that were fairly high to then very, very low viral loads. But then when it was brought to these larger clinical trials, it ended up killing people. Um, and I think this one line from from one of the studies says it all. The results of the Wright 702 study described here confirm that the use of high-dose hydroxyurea can be associated with fatal pancreatitis. And so when this happened, people were no longer interested in this drug. It just seemed like this was too dangerous. They, they really wanted to have nothing to do with a drug that could kill people, understandably. Um, and one thing that Juliana said later, I think is very telling, she said, if no one can make money, even the best drug in the world will fail. And that's not to say that hydroxyurea is what we should return to or is any way a drug that we should revisit, but it's this idea of, of how these clinical trials are performed and, and, how, and how they're structured that I think is something to think about. Now at the same time that hydroxyurea wasn't doing well, Timothy Brown was diagnosed with cancer. He was an American living in Berlin. He'd been HIV positive for 10 years. And by coincidence, his family doctor was Heiko Jensen, so the same doctor that treated the first Berlin patient. And so Heiko referred him to Charity Hospital, where his oncologist was Gero Hutter. Now this was Gero's first patient with HIV. Um, and immediately, Timothy started rounds of chemo, which went very poorly. They made him incredibly sick. He had kidney failure, he had to stop his drugs, um, and it all looked like he definitely needed a stem cell transplant. And so Giro had this very crazy idea. He thought, well, instead of just taking stem cells from a normal donor, why don't we find someone who has this Delta 32 mutation? So he thought back to that paper that he'd read in his med school library, and he said, well, why don't we find someone who's homozygous for Delta 32, take their cells, transplant them into Timothy, and then the idea is that these cells would then have a selective advantage and cure Timothy of both cancer and HIV. And his colleagues at Charity Hospital were not impressed. They thought this was a terrible idea, and so they explained to him, the HIV reservoir is too big. There is no way that you're going to be able to make every cell in Timothy's body delta 32 and resistant to HIV. 
Um, they talked, of course, about the risk of stem cell transplants. There was no animal model for doing anything like this, so they really had no idea the strategy was at all feasible. And then the one thing that the infectious disease doctors really stressed to Giro was about CXCR4 viruses. And these are, of course, the viruses um, that are not protected by the Delta 32 mutation that use a different receptor. And so these doctors told Giro, you're going to make his HIV worse. Even if you're able to get rid of all of the CCR5 using HIV, these viruses, which are much more pathogenic, are going to come back, and you are really going to make the problem bad. Um, but Giro kind of ignored this. He <laughs> felt very strongly still that this was the way to go. Um, and so they started to get ready to do a stem cell transplant in Timothy. So at this time, Giro told Timothy, take a vacation, go to Italy, relax, and we're going to get things set up here. Um, the first thing they had to do was actually convince the hospital that someone with HIV could even get a stem cell transplant because at that time there was still this rule, this archaic rule left over from the 80s, this idea that people with HIV don't deserve a stem cell transplant because they're not going to live anyway. So first he had to get around that. And then he had to find someone that was an appropriate donor for Timothy that had this Delta 32 mutation. Um, and this could really only be done in Germany because Germany has the largest bone marrow transplant registry. And so they were able to find not one, but a dozen people who all fit this criteria. So Timothy had the transplant, and afterwards, he felt great. He went back to work, he went back to the gym, he was just happy in love with his boyfriend, and things were looking so good biologically as well, because he went from being heterozygous for Delta 32, now to being homozygous, and also, HIV became detectable. So really, Giro and Timothy at this point could not be happier. But then, just a little under a year after the transplant, he had a relapse. And now he needed a second stem cell transplant. So they brought in the same donor, got him another transplant. But this time, Timothy didn't recover. He started mysteriously just losing function in his legs and his arms, and he couldn't move. He couldn't get out of bed. He couldn't control his bladder. Uh, things were looking as bad as bad as they could look. And the physicians actually called his boyfriend and, and called his mom and said, this is the end. You know, he only has days left at this point. But then what happened is they did a second brain biopsy on Timothy. And what they found was is that there had been a medical error where they had an accidental tear in the membrane that covered Timothy's brain. And this accounted for basically 90% of all of these crazy neurological symptoms. So they repaired the tear and just hoped he would start getting better. Um, now, if it wasn't for kind of cancer and these medical errors, Giro would be very excited about what was happening with HIV in Timothy because that data was beautiful. You suddenly had the virus go to nothing, T cells were looking up. Um, but as it was, 2008 was a difficult year. Timothy was doing poorly. Uh, Giro had submitted a paper to the New England Journal of Medicine that the reviewer seemed to like, but that the editor ultimately rejected. And he had hoped to be able to have a talk at CROI at this big HIV conference, but instead he was given a poster and mostly ignored. Uh, and then there were other bad things that were happening with Timothy during this year as well. So they found that there were some CCR5 positive macrophages when they did a rectal biopsy. And this is, of course, what people at Charity Hospital had told Giro would happen, that you would not be able to get every cell to be Delta 32. And so for that reason, you couldn't possibly protect all of the cells in Timothy's body from HIV. And they also found X4 viruses, or at least the V3 loops of X4 viruses when they did ultra deep sequencing. And now here, of course, is exactly what the ID docs had told Giro, that X4 is going to come back. So things were not looking good. And then Giro went to a think tank in Boston. And there he met a reporter named Mark Schuess, who wrote the story about him in the Wall Street Journal. And Giro was worried that this story in a popular press article would hurt his chances of being published. But actually, the opposite was true. It seemed to lend him credibility that he simply didn't have in the field. And shortly after that, he was able 
to publish this paper. And at the same time, Timothy is now starting to do better. So today, of course, Timothy has been through so much, as much as you could possibly ask any patient to go through lumbar punctures and colonoscopies and all of these blood draws. Um, and I think it's, it's very telling, this one quote from a paper published last year, the patient, Timothy, certainly meets any clinical definition for having achieved a long-term remission and may even have had a sterilizing cure. Now, whether or not Timothy's cure is sterilizing or functional, the, the really incredible thing is the impact that this has had on the field. So similar to how Christian's story was split up after that paper was published, here things got split up as well. So the paper uh, got split into looking at genetic therapies and then also looking at bone marrow transplants. So there's all of these different components that make up Timothy's cure, and we have to find some way to fight through them to understand what's really at the heart of this. And just to talk briefly about the Boston patients for a minute, so this was started by a fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital named Tim, Tim Henrick, who was just inspired by Timothy Brown's story, and he wanted to try to understand how HIV hides in the body and he wanted to understand what role bone marrow transplants have. Um, he wasn't trying to cure HIV. So he, he found with his advisor, he found these patients retrospectively that had some similarities to Timothy. They had also gotten stem cell transplants. They were HIV positive and they had cancer. But there were some differences to Timothy as well. Timothy got this very high dose of radiation, got a, this big conditioning regimen. Uh, there's some differences in the amount of graft versus host disease. And of course, Timothy also had HIV resistant cells, which these patients didn't. And the biggest difference is that uh, when they were taken off therapy, of course, the virus came back. Um, and we still, and so this can give us some insight into what's happening with the virus and, and how it makes up a reservoir in the body. Um, but it still doesn't exactly answer the question of Timothy's cure. But I think you know, the real point here is that stem cell transplants were never the answer to curing HIV. So these, these cases aren't, aren't necessarily disappointing for the field, although they're disappointing for the two men involved. Um, but it kind of gives us a larger picture of how HIV hides in the body. So I, what's really surprising to me is how the impact of just these two stories has had such a great influence on HIV research today. And this can be seen in, in many quotes from grant reports and from researchers. Here's one from AMFAR stating that the, their, their interest in funding gene therapy comes from Timothy Brown's case. Um, and similarly, Dr. Rosenberg has said that um, that his trials of, of early therapy and that of the Visconti cohort um, were inspired by the first Berlin patient. Um, and CIRM has also said that it's really this, this case of Timothy Brown that has inspired an incredible amount of funding for HIV cure research. Um, and Christian's case has certainly influenced that of early therapy. And so we see these cases of a toddler cured of HIV of the Visconti cohort, and we can trace them back to Christian's influence in, in getting the field excited about early therapy, a question that we still don't have an answer to. Um, he similarly impacted that of eradication therapy. So this idea that we can take drugs to attack the cell. Um, so here I'm talking about the trials that have been done with HDAC inhibitors, where you're forcing DNA to unwind so that latent HIV is released, um, which then is killed by therapy. And, and can possibly result in a functional cure. And it is the similar idea that we attack the cell. And Timothy's case, of course, has inspired many gene therapies. Um, and I've kind of just briefly listed here a few of the clinical trials that I, I think have, have really been inspired by and have gotten people, gotten people excited and gotten funding for in particular. Um, so pursuing cure strategies is an inherently risky thing, but what's interesting is how these personal stories really have the ability to change how we look at the research and particularly how we fund it. 
And we now have these multiple clinical trials that are all pursuing cure and eradication research. So thank you so much. You're rescuing me from a snowy Boston winter. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> and I have a, a book that's coming at the end of the month that goes into a lot more detail of both the science and especially these personal stories. So thanks so much. It's really because they've gotten so much attention. They're both flashy stories. You know, I think a lot of us have forgotten about that first Berlin patient, but at the time, his story was really exciting, got a lot of media attention. People were buzzed about a cure to HIV. Um, and it is, a, it is surprising how much individual stories really can influence the way the field goes. And I guess it, it sort of shows that scientists and physicians are susceptible to, to human interest stories as anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems like if you want to kind of promote your field of interest, should you kind of go more for a PR approach? <laughs> Well, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think what's important is that neither of, of these cases, neither of the Berlin patients are cures that anyone would want. Nobody would want to go through any of that. And so you certainly wouldn't want to have anyone go through all of that for PR, especially. That would just be a tragic thing. Any questions? Um, maybe I can ask the last question. Where do you think that we are right now today in terms of optimism or pessimism about stem cell therapy to cure HIV? Because it seems like the news changes every day. You know, the, the, there's no HIV, and then they find HIV in some of these patients, and then, no, that was a mistake, it was a PCR contaminant, you know? So where do you, where do you think that we are right now? Yeah, I mean, this is the question that nobody, like, nobody ever wants to put a, a time estimate, of course. And I think these things do kind of go in trends. You sort of see public interest going up and down for each of these cases, but we are at, we're at such an exciting time right now. And I think that when you talk to people in this field, you really feel that there are just big changes happening. Um, but there still is that fear of how you go from these really exciting findings that are happening to make that bridge to the big clinical trial and who's gonna fund that and how that's gonna happen is still, this is a, a, a really important question that we have to ask ourselves. You, towards the end of your presentation there, I thought was very interesting. You said that there were kind of two camps that have kind of split out of the uh, second Berlin patient about stem cells and gene therapy. What do you think about combining the two, using stem cells and gene therapy together in order to create what happened to Timothy Brown, but through a more applicable, potentially, sort of treatment? And there's certainly people doing that. There are people that are looking at, that's something actually that I worked on during my, my PhD and there are clinical trials now, of people that are very interested in, in how to make this happen with stem cells. But what I think is interesting about that split is that there are also people that are interested, not so much in giving stem cell transplants to people because that of course would be crazy, but there's people that are very interested in how you reset the immune system and, and what role eradication, irradiation and graft versus host disease. So there are actually still these, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? You have these cases and both of them are still just bringing up so many debates, like what, what actually happened in this person? Why don't they have HIV anymore? And the answer isn't simple. We, we still aren't at the heart of it for either patient, really. Because one thing I think people kind of forget with Timothy Brown is that radiation and cytotoxic chemotherapy is a very effective antiretroviral because it kills all the cells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the HIV needs to be able to grow. Yeah. And the fact you got it done twice with total body radiation and cytotoxic chemotherapy, it's not too surprising that he could be eradicated. 
Yes, okay. yeah. I mean, it, uh, unfortunately, that's not something most people would want to go no, through. Not very true. But there are people that are kind of interested, you know, in, in how you could and how you could sort of adapt that part of it as well. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think are the best ways to kind of combat that perception? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the stigma associated with HIV is not something that can be easily combated. I, 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 I mean, I think that that's something that affects not just cure research, but probably affects every part of HIV research. And I wish I had a some solution because that's. I mean, I, I think. You know, hopefully things are getting better, um, but I, you know, I think it is a big problem. Anyone else? Right. Thank you. Right. Very much.